that's aimed at streamlining and coordinating youth behavioral health services for school age kids here in Pierce County. And so one of the things that we've been doing on, I think, a monthly basis for the last year is facilitating these webinars for parents and caregivers and community members to talk about things within our youth behavioral health system, to highlight existing resources, and really feature some of our local community providers. So the goal for today is that we'll provide an overview of our youth behavioral health system here in Pierce County so that you'll leave here with a better understanding of what is available in terms of some of the resources that we have here. And also in hopes that we can have a better understanding of the resources and how we can collaborate to ensure that youth are getting access to the level of resources they need when they need them. So today's presentation is gonna feature some of our community organizations that help support kids and family um, within Pierce County. Um, I do want you to know that while we have some of our great organizations here, there are some organizations that were not able to be present and you can always access the Kids Mental Health Pierce County website to see additional resources that are available here in Pierce County that we hope to hear from in the future as well. A second goal for today is to provide a form of community. We know that not one single system is gonna be able to address all the behavioral health needs of our kids and families. And so the more that we're able to collaborate, share information and connect, the greater uh, safety net we'll be able to create for our kids and families. So I would just ask if you can maybe introduce yourself in the chat box, say where you're from, um, just let us know who's all here today. I think that that would be really helpful for our speakers. Um, and just again, provide that form of community. Also, if you have additional resources that you would like to share or strategies that have worked for you to get connected to services, share those in the chat box as well. Um, there is also a Q&A tab that is available to you um, throughout our panel. Um, you'll be able to ask questions and then we'll have some time at the end today to be able to answer some of those questions. Um, if we're not able to get to the questions, we will try to respond to you via email and do our best to answer all those questions. Um, what I would ask is because we do have limited time today, if you have case specific questions that you email me after today and we can get you connected to that specific provider and have more time to discuss your specific case needs. Um, but again, we wanna ask and answer any of those general questions that we may be able to answer today. Um, we are also recording today's meeting and this will be posted to our Kids Mental Health Pierce County website. Um, so if you have any parents or caregivers or youth that you're working with that may not have been able to attend today, they should be able to access this through our website and our YouTube page. So again, thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you to all of our panelists who have um, come here today to share some information about their resources as well. So before we transition to hearing from some of our community uh, providers, I thought that it would be helpful for us to just have some information and some conversation about the pediatric behavioral health system. Um, the youth mental health system is different definitely than the adult system. Um, I think that we have heard about the concerns and the rise of youth mental health needs, not only in Pierce County, but across our state and across our country. Um, and so with that, I do think that it's important to note that this is um, a concern that has been coming up nationwide and that we have been working really hard in Pierce County to develop a coordinated system um, that is as unique and diverse as the community that we serve. Um, so while this is not unique to Pierce County, there are some definitely some unique challenges that we have here um, within our population and some unique data as well. Um, so mental illness does represent the second to third leading cause of hospitalization in our county for kids 10 to 18. And then also noting that um, concerns around suicidality has been a significant concern, not only within Pierce County, but Washington State. There are, are a lot of things that impact our behavioral health system. One of the things that we have been talking about, um, not only now, but prior to the pandemic was our workforce challenges. And that is gonna have a pretty significant impact on how uh, people access services. Um, many of our organization have vacancies that have been very challenging to fill, which impacts our capacity. And so it's gonna be really important for us as a community to have a way to identify what youth needs are to ensure that we're able to connect them to the right level of service when they need them. Um, and so the more that we're able again to partner and share those resources and information, um, the more access that we're gonna be able to provide to the community. 
So this is just a visual of different types of services. So I think it's really important to really think about that continuum of care, right? I know we talk a lot about crisis and crisis intervention, but there are things that can happen before a crisis occurs, such as preventative services. We talk a lot about um, going upstream and being able to provide that pathway to hopefully reduce some of those crisis services. And so this is kind of a, a great kind of visual map of some of those different levels of services and some of the things that within our community that can help do that. Um, so when we look at prevention, you know, are our kids going to their primary care doctor? Um, we have some great models and partnerships in our county where, you know, with some of the primary care doctors, they have behavioral health navigators that can connect them um, that may reduce their time for being able to get a behavioral health appointment. Um, you know, are we working with our schools and, and making sure that our schools are connected uh, to mental health providers and being able to provide support? And so there are different levels and intensity of services um, that are able to meet different levels of needs. And I think it's just important to know about the different types of resources um, that may be able to be that preventative measure or what we can do in a crisis and even more what we can do after a crisis to help support that recovery and reintegration back into the community. Just some important things to note about how adolescents access mental health treatment here in Washington State. So the age of consent here in Washington State is 13, which means that if you are 13 and above, you can consent to your own mental health treatment. Um, if you are under the age of 13, we do need consent um, in order to participate in that treatment. The other thing that we have in Washington is what we call family initiated treatment. And so what that means is a youth denial to participate in services is not a reason alone to decline them, right? So this gives an opportunity for a clinician to be able to still engage that youth in, in to treatment um, and try to um, engage them in that process. Um, there still needs to be what we call medical necessity. So they still have to meet that criteria for that level of treatment. But it's good to know that just because the youth says, no, I don't wanna do that, doesn't mean that the door just closes. There's still some opportunity for that clinician to be able to engage them under that family initiated treatment. And then the third thing that we have here in Washington State is what we call involuntary treatment or an ITA. So that is when, again, that medical necessity is met, the, the youth has been identified as a danger to themselves, a danger to others, are what we call gravely disabled, meaning that there are some symptoms where their um, basic needs are being impacted and they're not able to function in that way where their safety is compromised. In those situations, there could be a referral to what we call a designated crisis responder or DCR, and they can do an evaluation and that youth can be court ordered into mental health treatment. So those are the three pathways how youth are able to access mental health treatment here in the state of Washington. And I know that that is a brief overview. I think we could spend a lot of time talking about that and how we support parents and um, clinicians through that process. There is some additional information about this on the Kids Mental Health Pierce County website. And if you need some additional resources on those three options, we can um, definitely connect and I can provide you with some more resources as well. I do think it's important to know there are laws that support information sharing. And I know in Pierce County, we have talked a lot about some of the barriers in terms of access and care coordination. Um, as we know, it's really important for us to be able to share information, um, particularly in crisis situations where we're kind of only being able to capture that youth in the moment. It's really important for us to have that collateral. So if you're working with the youth and you're referring them to services, it's really helpful for you to be able to connect with that clinician to share information about, you know, any risk factors that you've identified, protective factors, really information that will help that clinician make that thorough assessment. And so it's important to know and have reference to some of these RCWs for when you are advocating with an adult uh, or advocating for a youth, kind of knowing what some of the resources are for you to be able to share that information and have information shared with you as well to help support them in the community or school um, when it's appropriate. Um, it's important to know that the law is different based on mental health versus substance use disorders. So making sure that there is a written release if there's um, any kind of omission under a substance use disorder evaluation or treatment. And lastly, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about COVID-19 and the impact on the youth behavioral health 
system. Um, so I know that there has been uh, a growing concern about the impact of the pandemic on youth mental health. Um, one of the things that I just really want to emphasize is we were in a behavioral health crisis before the pandemic, right? This is something that we have recognized within our community was of significant concern. Um, and that's why we have a coalition like Kids Mental Health Pierce County that was formed in 2018. So we were seeing the rise in volumes. We were seeing more kids come to the emergency department. We were seeing the hospitalizations. Um, but what COVID-19 really did was highlight some of the gaps and need for some of those intensive home-based services, right? So we were seeing this not only in Pierce County, but statewide, so much so our governor signed a proclamation that also provided support and some um, specialized emphasis in looking at the youth behavioral health needs and what supports can be provided on the state level. Um, it also impacted our provider capacity, right? So one of our local inpatient units closed, which had a significant impact on our bed capacity for kids who need higher level intensity. Um, early in the pandemic, also face-to-face -face services were reduced. So a lot of our families who need that family level support, some of those in-home services were taken away and not available to them. And so that really impacted them. Um, and while we have added telehealth as an option, we know that that is not going to be a universal response to all of our kids, right? There are things within the family where telehealth might not be um, an appropriate thing. There's equity issues where not all of our communities have access to internet and technology that would support that. So it definitely impacted how youth were able to access services um, and just the capacity and workforce challenges as well. Um, and then our emergency department utilization. Again, as I mentioned before, I wouldn't say that there was a significant change in the volume, but definitely a change in the severity of the mental health uh, symptoms that we were seeing. And then adding that provider capacity challenge and less capacity, that reduces the options for discharge, which means that they end up staying in the hospital a bit longer. So those are some of the really unique challenges that we've seen in, in terms of COVID. And I'm sure uh, my peers will be able to talk about more things that they're seeing as well. But I just think that it's important to note, right, as we move forward into this school year, as we're getting more face-to-face -face opportunities to interact with our kids and get them resources and supports that they need is just being mindful of those things and, and really being able to support families through this complex behavioral health system that we know exists. And so I think the more, again, that we're able to share information, be that helping hand and support through this process, and again, share our resources and expertise, I think um, we will have a greater safety net for the kids and family here in our community. And this again, just kind of shows that comparison. You know, I wanted to speak to before, um, you know, that these were not new issues related to COVID. Um, I know that we have seen an increase um, in the kids that have come into our emergency department, but also looking at this shows that this is kind of an expected thing that happens around the beginning of a school year. So you kind of see that spike. And our trends have typically been around a school year where you kind of see kids come in more and need more needs as school starts. And then during summer lulls and breaks, you see that reduction. And so again, just wanting to emphasize that these are not necessarily new trends. These are things that we've seen before. And again, just being able to share the resources and get kids connected to the level of support that they need. All right. So again, in closing, uh, just not one single system is going to be able to be uh, the single response to all this, right? And that goes back to that continuum of care and knowing that kids are going to need different levels of supports and resources. And again, knowing the more that we're able to interact and share information and communicate, um, I think that we as a county have been really creative in our response and building these partnerships and holding multidisciplinary team meetings and bringing all these different stakeholders to the table to be able to problem solve around some really complex needs within our community, I think has just been extremely helpful. So after today, I hope you continue to join this work. Um, Kids Mental Health Pierce County is open to the community. We have action teams every month that you can participate in um, and share those resources and strategies so that we can continue to work towards creating that coordinated um, response and system for our kids. So, so with that being said, I have the absolute honor of being able to introduce some of our wonderful community-based organizations here in Pierce County that provide services to our families here in Pierce County. 
Um, so first, we're going to hear from Consejo, and I'm lucky to have Yvonne Elmendorf and Daisy Abreu here. Yvonne is the Tacoma Behavioral Health Program Manager, and Daisy is the South Regional Behavioral Health Director. So I am going to turn it over to Yvonne and Daisy, who can share some information with us about Consejo. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see, is Yvonne among the panelists? Let me, I will move her over. There we go. Hello. Right, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I guess I can start with Consejo. So um, we are Consejo Counseling and Referral Service. Um, we are, when it comes to school-based services, we have been serving Pierce County here in um, the Pierce County area since 2005. And we have been around for 43 years. Um, started serving school-based services in King County a long time ago. Um, I'll first talk about youth SUD services, um, and then I'll let Daisy go into the psychiatric and mental health services. But um, for substance use disorder, um, we actually, that is the first program that we started here in Pierce County back in 2005, serving, um, we started with Franklin Pierce School District and um, the Puyallup Tribe serving youth um, who are struggling with either um, experimental abuse or addiction of substances. Um, and we continue to provide that service till this day. We have contracts with our MOUs with almost all school districts. We're working on finishing up MOUs with the last three or four districts in the county. And what we do is we're able to provide um, comprehensive ASAM assessments and evaluations for kiddos that um, have been experimenting with substance use or using actively substances. We do the assessment, we engage them, um, create them a comprehensive treatment plan. We come to the school and see them if that's something that needs to happen. We provide transportation for them. We can pick them up from home to bring them to their recovery activities and groups. Um, we provide a lot of outreach um, to the families. We also do adult services, so we can work with families um, in the community of the school. Um, what else am I forgetting? We have recovery coaches that actually work with the kids. Um, it just, it's, it's peer support, but it has to do with substance use disorder, and it keeps, helps engage the kids, keeping them connected um, on the recovery pathway, um, helping them reach their goals when it comes to just being stable and being healthy in the community and within their circles. We also do a lot of really fun activities with our youth programs. Um, anybody who's registered in our programs has access to all the field trips we do. In the summertime and spring, we take the kids on hikes up to the mountain, we take them to the lakes. Um, they've did sailing lessons out in the lake in Seattle, um, just lots of fun things we do every year just to keep them involved and get the youth out of their homes and out of their communities um, and teach them how to experience fun, healthy things um, without using substances. Um, we also have violence reduction and gang intervention programs for youth in Tacoma and also youth who don't necessarily live in Tacoma, but um, may be connected to have been affected by or connected to violence um, and gangs that are around the Tacoma area. Um, so we can do outreach and mentorship and intervention. And with those youth, they do not have to be substance use or mental health necessarily. Um, but as long as they have been affected by gang violence or um, participated somehow in it or in um, their friends are participating in it, we can work with them to help connect them. And it's youth up to age 30. So we can work with them and their family members to connect them with housing, um, 
employment services, all the resources um, that they will need to be more steady and healthy in their community. And I will pass it to Daisy and let her talk a little bit about mental health. Um, yes, one of the wonderful things um, about um, our programs is that we um, make an effort to just work uh, very integrative within each other. Um, within the mental health uh, department, uh, we have kids that are also enrolled in SUD or in violence prevention with case management and in other areas um, of consejo as well and vice versa. Um, with uh, the mental health um, kids that we serve, we go to schools from elementary, middle schools, high schools. Um, we have presence in um, most uh, of, of our districts here in Pierce County. We do screenings and assessments uh, in school, if necessary, or where uh, the kids are. Um, we are community-based programs, so we will make sure that we go to our clients where they're at, in this case, children or adults, but the children will be in the schools, their home, We'll bring them here, pick them up, bring them here, take them home, um, as uh, Yvonne mentioned, and make sure that we have that connection where we can look at their needs and provide. Um, our assessment will look at a complete uh, area of their needs. They will, we will look at the trauma history, we will look at um, history of substance use, uh, history of lack of medical care. Um, we'll make sure to try to connect them with those areas that are right now gaps in, uh, in their ability to be successful in, uh, in schools and within their families. We we'll make sure that we bring the family if that is something that the youth wants. Uh, after 13, uh, they want the family to be involved to get that support. That is something that we will also um, be doing, just doing some family interventions, family therapy. We'll bring case management to the home to help them with needs that they might have because this family might be struggling with uh, losing housing or they might be struggling with lack of enough food. So we will try to address all of those issues. Also within our department, we have uh, the ability to uh, connect them with case management so they, those needs can be addressed. We have um, ARMP access for medication and psychiatric assessments. We have uh, peer counseling um, and we are not only uh, be able to provide these things, but also uh, with our Latinx community, we will be able to speak in their own language and address the needs of these families uh, in uh, a very culturally sensitive way with uh, therapists that have know where they came from and be able to relate to, to the needs of the whole family. Thank you so much. That was really helpful, Yvonne and Daisy, and you guys are a great uh, partner and, and you guys are embedded in so many different school districts as well. Um, so if you have any questions for Yvonne or Daisy, put those in the Q&A and we will do our best to answer those throughout the webinar and then at the end during questions and answers. So thank you, Yvonne and Daisy. So next we are going to hear from our community partners at Greater Lakes. And from Greater Lakes, we have Sally McDaniel here today. And Sally is the clinical manager in child and family services at Greater Lakes. She's been with Greater Lakes for 11 years, working primarily with children. She has a passion for working with school systems to advocate for the needs of the youth, as well as working with younger children and their families. Um, she's worked in the school setting for over 30 years, both as a teacher and counselor, and has worked, worked extensively with schools to develop behavior plans, including IEPs, 504s, functional behavior assessments, and behavior intervention plans. 
Um, so I am going to turn it over to you, Sally. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Is that possible? Yep, there yeah. it is. Oh, uh, actually, I wanted to share my other one, but I guess that one will work. Um, okay. So, uh, hold on a minute. I wanted to share my other screen, so I'm looking at the camera, but I guess I can do this one. Let's see if I can. All right. So, like she said, my name is Sally McDaniel, and I'm a manager in the Child and Family Department. Um, some of the services we provide um, include individually tailored um, outpatient services for children and youth up to age 24 that we serve in our department. Um, we do family therapy, individual therapy, group therapy. We have peers. Uh, we can do psychiatric assessments, medication management, and uh, referrals and coordination with other um, supportive community services. We work a lot with juvenile justice, um, DSHS. Um, we work in SUD services with um, other organizations. Um, one of our biggest things we do is school-based therapy services. Um, we primarily serve the Medicaid population, but we do have contracts with three school districts um, to serve those above and beyond the Medicaid eligible. Um, we, have, we work with the Clover Park School District, both Medicaid and contracts. So um, much like everyone else spoke to the MOUs, all these other districts, we have MOUs, but we have some what we call contracts. That's money that's given to us by the schools to serve um, those above and beyond the Medicaid. Um, Franklin Pierce Schools, we have Medicaid and contracts, Bethel School District, Silicon, um, University Place, Tacoma School District. Um, and then we also have an additional contract for ECAP and Head Start. Um, we have two locations right now, um, a Lakewood location, which is um, just right here um, in Lakewood. And then we have a Spanaway location. Um, you can access our website um, to look at all of our services and enroll and get some of the paperwork started. Um, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 7.30. Friday is 8 to 5. Um, this is the number to call to enroll. And then I left my number um, on there as well. So did, did anybody have any questions? Thank you, Sally. And we will be sharing these slides afterwards so you can have that information. And then um, this information is also posted to the website. Um, so if you have any questions, again, we do have that Q&A button. Sally's gonna stick around. So if any of those questions come up, we will either answer them through that questions and answer feature or we will answer them at the end of the webinar today. So thank you, Sally. Thank you. All right, so next we are going to hear from our community partners at Comprehensive Life Resources. And we have Brittany Prince with us today. And Brittany is a licensed mental health counselor. She's been at CLR for three years in the roles of therapist and currently the manager of Children's Outpatient Services. Brittany has worked in community mental health for five years in Pierce County and manages the day-to-day -day of our youth outpatient clinic and school-based services. So I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. Hey y'all, uh, thanks Ashley for that intro. Um, I am Brittany Prince and I'm with Comprehensive Life Resources. Um, as it sounds like kind of the common theme here that I'm hearing today, um, really for our outpatient services is we are identifying you know, the need of the youth and that are coming into our clinic um, and trying to fill the gaps there. So identifying, um, looking at the individual as a whole, identifying what their needs are and tailoring treatment to best support those needs. Um, at our outpatient clinic, we serve uh, littles up until 18. Um, at our outpatient youth clinic, we also can serve like early 20 year olds as well. Um, and really just identifying what it is their treatment goals are and supporting that the best we can um, and connecting with other community providers uh, for referrals when needed. We are also out in uh, the school districts as well. Um, we're in more of the rural districts this year, uh, which we're excited to provide. And again, that's providing mental health services within the schools. Um, and our clinicians go out and kind of do their thing. 
Um, we serve our Medicaid population um, as well as some private insurance. And we um, are doing intakes right now and all of our um, individuals have any further questions can call our main phone number to kind of get a head start on asking any questions and just seeing what other services that we can provide and what our intake process looks like. Thank you, Brittany, so much. And Brittany, you're gonna stick around too for our Q&A panel. All right, well, if you have any questions, I encourage you to use that Q&A panel. Um, we'll be answering questions throughout and then we'll also bring our providers back up um, at the end of everyone's presentation. So moving along, next we're gonna hear from our community partners at MultiCare Behavioral Health. And we have Amy Presendowski with us. And Amy is a psychologist who has worked for MultiCare for 19 years. Her specialty is working with children with developmental differences. Um, she is currently the manager of child and family services and children's specialty care at MultiCare multi Behavioral Health. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Amy. Okay, I, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna to try to share my screen. If you can't, I got you, I have them on standby. Okay, is it sharing? No. It's not sharing. Okay, why don't you share? Okay. <laughs> All right. There we go. Okay. All right, so uh, as uh, Ashley said, my name is Amy Presmodowski and I have been the manager of child and family services for the last year and a half. Do you wanna click through this, Ashley? Um, I am in charge of um, those two buildings that were back before. Um, the top one is the children's therapy unit, which houses children's specialty care, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then the bottom picture is child and family services at MultiCare Behavioral Health. Next. Uh, the mission for uh, MultiCare Behavioral Health is partnering for healing and a healthy future. And the values are respect, integrity, collaboration, stewardship, excellence, and kindness. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about MultiCare Behavioral Health Services. Uh, we are located in downtown Puyallup. And we also provide services in five different school districts. Um, that would include Puyallup, Sumner, Bonnie Lake, Ording, Tacoma, and White River. I'm gonna to try to leave here so you can only hear me once. Okay, um, so we provide outpatient mental health services, individual therapy, family therapy, um, peer services and family support for the clients who have Medicaid. And we also have medication management with our psychiatry team for people who are actively enrolled in therapy services. Common diagnoses would be working with trauma, anxiety, depression, behavior problems, and adjustment disorder. Um, and within Child and Family Services, we serve clients up to about the age of 21, uh, those who are uh, typically still in high school. So next, um, the insurance that we accept, most forms of Medicaid and um, commercial insurance. And next. And we are offering in-person services and telehealth, and then clients with Medicaid can also receive phone services if they're not able to come into the building um, or um, don't have the technology to be able to do telehealth. In the schools, we are um, navigating back and forth between telehealth and in-person, um, depending on the school district. And the way to access that would be to call 253-445-8120 to schedule an intake, and then you get assigned to a clinician. And next, if you have commercial insurance, there's just one extra step, and that is 
that clients need to be referred from a multi-care physician, a primary care physician. They do an internal referral call to BH23, and then the process is the same. They call access, and that number is on the final slide as well, so that you'll have access to that again. Children's specialty care um, essentially serves as, um, as another uh, team of mental health providers that is located at the Children's Therapy Unit in Puyallup. Uh, we provide the same kinds of services, but what's different about the clients who come to this clinic is that they have a developmental difference in addition to their mental health disorder. So most people have a diagnosis also of autism, intellectual disability, giftedness, or medical complexity, or uh, we also take siblings of kids who have that um, developmental difference because a lot of times there's depression, anxiety, or adjustment issues that are related to the family systems issues that occur when you have a child who's got a developmental difference going on. So next. Um, and again, the, the diagnoses that we treat are similar, but the, this team has additional training and specialized care um, to be able to modify their interventions to be more effective with uh, clients who've got one of these additional pieces going on like autism, intellectual disability, giftedness, or medical complexity. Uh, I will say also that we um, do have group therapy when we're not in COVID um, across both locations. I forgot to put that in the PowerPoint. Um, for MBH, the specialty care, we have uh, Medicaid and commercial insurance, same thing with in-person or telehealth phone therapy for uh, clients with Medicaid. The difference is, is that to get directly into children's specialty care, the referrals come from an internal process um, for kids who are in Marybridge Pediatric Therapy Services, so OTPT speech or audiology. The intent was, uh, when we were originally set up uh, a little over 40 years ago, was to support the unique mental health needs of those kids who had um, these medical complexities going on that require those additional services. Um, but the good thing is, is that now that I'm the manager of both services, if we have a child who comes into child and family services and really needs that additional specialty care, we can uh, work it out to refer back over there if we need to. Um, but what happens is, is that the Mary Bridge provider, so the OTPT speech or audiologist, will do an internal referral, and we take those from all the Mary Bridge sites in Puyallup, Tacoma, Gig Harbor, or Federal Way, but the only in-person service that we have for mental health services is in Puyallup. And then I guess the, the last piece that I wanted to emphasize, um, which is a piece that I have emphasized since I became manager a year and a half ago, is that um, I developed 10 hours of uh, clinical training to help clinicians recognize when there's one of these developmental differences present, autism, intellectual disability, or giftedness. And those are up on our multi-care learning management system. And every clinician who comes into either child and family services or children's specialty care gets that basic training to be able to recognize when there's one of those differences going on and may not have been identified before the child comes into service. And that oftentimes is a piece of the big picture that's uh, making life challenging for the child or for the family. And my goal is that every clinician will be able to recognize those differences when they're present so that they can ask for additional support and training regardless of which department they're working in. Because I firmly believe that every youth deserves treatment that fits where they are in development. And we're gonna be much more effective and efficient as a team if we uh, gear our treatment towards that. And I think the last one, is uh, just um, our access line. Um, again, that is to get into child and family services. And we thank you for trusting your child or teen's care to multi-care. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. 
And Amy's gonna stick around too. I do see some great questions coming in that chat box and we will get to those at the end of our community presentations. So thank you, Amy. So next we are going to hear from Youth Engagement Services and we have Kiana Carter who is a Youth Engagement Services or YES clinician at Mary Bridge Children's Hospital. Hello, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? I'm kind of in a weird part of the hospital. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so as Ashley said, um, I'm one of the clinicians with the Youth Engagement Services Program. Um, and so just about what Yes Tacoma is. So in 2020, um, OSPI allotted an allotment for a grant. So this is a grant funded program. Um, and so the Yes Tacoma program is a collaborative partnership between Mary Bridge Children's Hospital, Tacoma Public School District and Kids Mental Health Pierce County. And really the overall goal of this program is to provide behavioral health support services to Tacoma public school families um, and students. Um, really focusing on those kiddos who are at risk of harm to self and others, incarceration, inpatient, um, psychiatric hospitalization, foster care, or DCYF involvement, um, really just like underlying behavioral health issues um, that could be impacting their ability to be successful at school or at home. Okay. So the Youth Engagement Services Program is broken up into three tiers. Um, tier one is our behavioral health navigation. Tier two is multidisciplinary team meeting consultation. And tier three is gonna be that brief therapeutic intervention for up to 90 days. Um, and really the referral process for this is we're really trying to identify students who are at risk of interrupted learning due to severe behavioral health risk factors. And so really we are trying to promote continuity of care, connecting kiddos to appropriate services, and also providing brief interventions if necessary. And then something really cool that we get to do and be a part of is our community uh, multidisciplinary team meetings um, with Kids Mental Health Pierce County. And these are really awesome because we're able to pull in school staff support. Um, if a kiddo is enrolled in DDA, if they have DCYF or um, juvenile justice system involvement, we're able to pull all of those different community providers in one meeting and really focus on that continuity of care and collaborative efforts to make sure that we are addressing this kiddo's behavioral health needs. So really we're bringing all the different players to the table for these really kind of complex kiddos to make sure that they're getting that behavioral health support that we need. So what everybody really wants to know is the eligibility and referral process. So at this time, we are in Tacoma Public School District um, and we are serving students ages 13 and above. And so the personnel who are able to make those referrals are Tacoma Public School counselors um, and then also Mary Bridge Children's Hospital staff. And really the basic criteria for these referrals, we're really looking for kiddos with behavioral health needs. Um, and when we're defining complex uh, behavioral health presentations, we're looking for a couple of different factors. So we're looking at youth with high risk behaviors or risk factors such as self-harm, um, ongoing suicidal ideations, uh, youth involved in two or more systems, as I spoke about earlier, whether that's the juvenile justice system, substance use disorder, mental health, DCYF, really those kids with multiple system involvement who need that extra support and coordination and continuity of care. Um, we're also looking at youth who are identified as high utilizers of the crisis mental health system. So that could be a youth who's accessing crisis services a lot, who is visiting um, emergency departments for behavioral health related concerns. Those kiddos who are just really struggling and falling through the system. And then really any other complex psychosocial presentation. Um, and if you're worried about whether or not a youth would be a, an appropriate referral, please feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to do consultation and support in whatever way that we can. And then my favorite part, this is um, our team. Um, unfortunately, we are missing our newest team member, Sam. And so she will be in the Puyallup School District providing behavioral health navigation support. So I did wanna make sure that we plug Sam, but this is yes, Tacoma and our team. 
Um, and in terms of like making referrals, if you're a school counselor or a Mary Bridge Children's Hospital uh, personnel, you can use the Kids Mental Health Pierce County website. Um, and we have a link um, under yes to come and you can make a referral there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to hit up Ashley or myself. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kiana. Um, the only thing that I would add to that is that we do see kids regardless of insurance. So in the YES program, we see both Medicaid eligible and commercial youth as well within that program. So thank you so much, Kiana, for that presentation of YES Tacoma. Um, so now I'm really excited to share, uh, introduce our community partners from Seneca. And today we have Stephanie Gertis with us. Stephanie is the program and clinical supervisor for the Seneca family of agencies. Uh, and they are going to be a new WISE provider here in Pierce County. So I really want to thank our county council and representatives here who have heard our concerns about the gaps in services for non-Medicaid eligible youth and provided some funding support to have a uh, WISE program for non-Medicaid youth. So um, Stephanie is here and she's gonna be able to talk a little bit more about that. But just to give you a little bit more about Stephanie, she has 15 years of experience working with the Seneca family of agencies and the past 10 years have been working exclusively focused in community-based services, which is a model of services she truly believes in and loves. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie to hear more about Seneca and their programs and resources that they have for families here in Pierce County. Thank you, Ashley. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Let's see, does that look okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you all for having me. Um, I realized that the Seneca Family of Agencies is a, new, a newer organization, um, especially in Pierce County and Washington. So I wanted to provide a little bit of background on our agency at large, and then also like move into the sort of program specific details of our new WISE program in Pierce County. Um, so Seneca was founded in 1985 as a small Bay Area residential and day treatment program uh, with a simple but powerful mission, which was to help children and families through the most difficult times of their lives. Uh, since then, Seneca has expanded to provide a broad continuum of permanency, mental health, education, and juvenile justice services, which today reach over 18,000 youth and families throughout California and Washington State each year. Um, the services that are offered agency-wide, um, and I just added that Seneca is a Joint Commission accredited organization, but we provide school-based mental health and behavioral health services, community-based work, outpatient clinics. We have juvenile justice focused support work, foster care and adoption, um, permanency and family finding. Um, we have a program that's focused currently on support for reunified immigrant families. Um, and we have our own Institute for Advanced Practice, which focuses on training, policy and advocacy. Um, and the services that we have and provide here in Washington are school-based mental and behavioral health, um, school specialist services, so, so things like occupational speech therapy, um, school psychology. We have an outpatient clinic, um, a juvenile justice and assessment team. We have a CSEC outreach program, and we have WISE. Um, just a note on Seneca's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, at Seneca, we're very committed to the practice of cultural humility, fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion within our workplaces, schools, and communities. And then here I added our uh, Seneca website in case you just had other questions or curiosities about Seneca as an agency. Um, moving into our WISE program. So we're really excited to get started in Pierce County. Um, I think that as, as Ashley has mentioned, that's one of sort of the gaps that's been there for a while is that uh, Medi like WISE was typically only available to, to youth with Medicaid. And so our program is a new service that's able to work with non-Medicaid eligible youth. So um, it'll, it'll be the typical WISE model. We will provide individual and family therapy. We have a 24 seven crisis hotline support. We have psychiatry services upon request um, and the team approach that will include a therapist, a care coordinator, a client advocate, um, 
and a family partner as well. Um, so as I mentioned, our program will work with non-Medicaid eligible youth. So that could be uninsured youth, um, youth with no insurance or youth that have commercially, um, commercial or private insurance that typically may not offer that robust service, something like WISE. Um, our children and youth will be between, could be between anywhere from zero to 21, have complex behavioral or mental health needs that require a higher level of care. So frequent involvement with child serving systems like foster care, out of home placement, juvenile justice, um, special education, psychiatric hospitalizations. Um, we will be able to serve youth anywhere in Pierce County. Um, we have the ability to provide in-person and virtual options. Um, and a lot of that will really be dependent on the youth and family preference. But if the kids and families want us in their community and in their homes, we can provide that. Um, additional information, we have the capacity to contract with um, language services so that we can work with families who may speak any one of 200 languages. Um, we have some bilingual staff available um, who can speak English and Spanish. Um, all of our staff are trained in working with CSEC um, and all clients over the age of 10 are screened regularly to evaluate that risk. And then of course, um, as others have mentioned, our work is very much uniquely tailored to meet the needs of the youth and families specifically. So we can use a variety of different treatment modalities to do what best suits the kids and families. Um, and to refer a youth, there is a phone number here, and this is our new email. I also have a referral that's um, and a flyer that's almost finished. And so when that is, I'm going to forward that to Ashley, and she'll be able to share it widely with you all. Um, and as others have mentioned as well, if there's ever a question about whether or not a particular child might qualify, like really feel, feel free to call me, email me, and I'm happy to think that through. Um, anyone can make a referral to our program. So that can be youth and family self-referral, hospitals or primary care physicians, 211, community therapists, school staff, community partners. Um, and this is our peers, Pierce Weiss um, email here. And then if there's any other questions, like really don't hesitate to call or email. I'm happy to think, you know, think a case through and see if, if WISE might be the best fit. And that's everything. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Stephanie. We are so excited to have you here in our county and looking forward to our continued partnership and collaboration. Um, and Stephanie's gonna stick around too. If you have any questions, we have that Q&A box um, as well as we'll answer any additional questions at the end. So thank you again, Stephanie. Thanks, Ashley. So I know that we talked about our wraparound with intensive services, our WISE program. And so here in Pierce County, we actually have three current providers that are providing that service to Medicaid eligible families. So I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany Radnich with Catholic Community Services, who can give us an overview of WISE. But before that, just to let you know a little bit more about Tiffany. Tiffany is a site director with Catholic Community Services Family Behavioral Health. She's been working in Y since its initial implementation in Pierce County in 2014. Brings a wealth of knowledge expertise to our county. And so I'm so excited to turn it over to Tiffany who can give us an overview of our WISE program. Ashley, I'm just sharing my screen here. Okay, so um, I am here to share a little bit about WISE or Wraparound with Intensive Services. Um, so this is a service that is available statewide um, for children and youth under the age of 21. Um, and it is an intensive um, mental health service um, for um, the agencies that I'm presenting for, um, you know, we serve the Medicaid or Medicaid eligible youth, but um, as you just heard, um, we are super excited to also have Seneca in our community um, to serve the non-Medicaid eligible youth and families, so we're super excited about that. Um, so for WISE, um, as Stephanie had briefly mentioned, um, you know, WISE is really geared for those youth who have 
um, challenging behaviors that are really impacting their daily functioning. Um, and so we may see an elevated risk of harm to themselves or others. So maybe there's some ongoing self-harm behavior happening or um, some reoccurring suicidal thoughts. Maybe there's been a suicide attempt. Um, youth who really struggle with physical aggression and those physical outbursts. Um, and these are youth that are in need of more intensive or maybe a little more individualized approach um, due to their complex needs. Um, maybe kind of traditional outpatient services um, aren't able to meet the need enough. Um, and so that's where WISE might be warranted. Um, oftentimes we see youth um, who are enrolled in WISE that are involved in multiple systems. So maybe they have worked in mental health, um, worked with mental health services before, maybe Child Protective Services is involved, or they've been to Raymond Hall a few times, there's juvenile justice involvement, um, different, different services and systems are currently involved or historically have been involved. Um, oftentimes youth and wise are in special education, so they might have an individualized education plan or a 504 plan. Um, so these are all things that might describe a youth that would be a good candidate for WISE. Certainly not all of these need to be true, but usually at least one of them um, is true for a youth who might be a good candidate for WISE. Um, in terms of what WISE does, um, so a couple of key components. Um, we are an intensive behavioral health service that utilizes um, a team approach. And so as Stephanie has, had mentioned, you know, on the WISE team, there are a couple of different um, players. And so the first one is a therapist. Um, so clinically trained, um, kind of leads the individual and family therapy aspect of WISE. There's a care coordinator who works um, closely with all the different people who are involved with the youth and family. As we talked about, often a good candidate for WISE is somebody who is involved with different systems. And so that care coordinator will um, work closely to coordinate all those different systems and services that are in place, also help the family with um, kind of pulling in their natural supports. Um, and then there is also a peer or two, a part of the team. And so we have parent peers who have experience as a parent, parenting a child um, who has complex needs. Um, and then we also have youth peers who are young adults um, who in their youth have experience that is similar to those of the youth that we serve in WISE. And so maybe they've been through mental health services themselves, juvenile justice, things like that. And so they're able to connect on more of a personal experience level, which is really helpful um, and adds a lot of value um, to the services that are provided. When we talk about intensive services and WISE being intensive, what that means is that that WISE team is meeting with the youth and family in their homes and the community throughout the week. And so, um, you know, they may meet their therapist um, maybe once, twice a week doing that individual and family therapy. They're also meeting with their peers um, to do that peer support work. And then that care coordinator might be meeting with them to help um, really build that support network that's needed. Um, and so it is uh, multiple appointments throughout the week, absolutely um, in families' homes, in the community at times that work best for the youth and family. Um, so if they need to meet us on the weekend, that's great. We will do that. Um, evening appointments are often when we're meeting youth and families when they're home from work and school. Um, and then the other element as well is that that WISE team is available to the youth and family 24 seven. So rather than calling through the county crisis line, youth enrolled in WISE um, call directly to their WISE team to get that crisis support. So there's phone coaching, there's in-person crisis support if that's needed, in-person risk assessments um, that is available to the youth and family for as long as that they're in WISE. Um, and then the collaborative approach of WISE, you know, a big part of this is, you know, making sure that everybody is working together towards a common goal and from a single plan. And so um, WISE will work closely with youth and family to build their team. Who's important to them, um, whether that's a teacher, a neighbor, a coach, um, maybe an aunt or an uncle, 
Um, who are those people that um, are meaningful to that youth and family, as well as formal support? So um, who are the people that are involved professionally for that youth or fa and family? Um, and if they don't have those kinds of supports, um, WISE really helps them to identify who those supports could be, um, because we know that um, youth and families that have complex things going on, they need support. Um, they need that network. We all do. Um, and so really helping families to build and strengthen their team. Um, and then a part of that is also to facilitate regular what we call team meetings. So bringing everybody together to make sure we're all working on the same plan um, towards a common goal where the youth and family's voice is the loudest at that table. So accessing WISE for Medicaid or Medicaid eligible youth um, we do have multiple WISE providers in Pierce County, um, but we do um, encourage using this um, WISE referral line, um, and it goes to an access team who will um, kind of gather the information needed to determine if a youth is eligible for WISE. Check Medicaid eligibility. There is a state um, screening tool and algorithm that is used. And so our access team will gather all of that information and determine eligibility. Um, if a youth is not eligible for WISE, um, we will work to get them connected to other services that might be helpful and supportive. But if they're determined eligible for WISE, um, they will get assigned a WISE team as soon as possible. Um, when we have immediate capacity, that's usually within, you know, 24 hours. Um, when we do have a little bit of a wait. The access team will work with that youth and family to support them in the meantime until their WISE team is available. And then as I mentioned, there are multiple WISE providers for Medicaid and Medicaid eligible youth. Um, so Catholic Community Services, where I'm from, um, Comprehensive Life Resources, and Castile Williams and Associates. Um, and each agency um, kind of has a little bit of a specialty with their focus, their niche, um, but absolutely will serve kind of any youth and family that comes through and gets referred. Um, Comprehensive Life Resources has a history as an agency working with um, youth that are in the foster care system. So that is an area of expertise for them. And then Castile Williams and Associates really has that passion and an interest in serving youth and families of color. And so they um, work hard to serve that population and provide um, kind of culturally relevant and supportive services. Um, and then Catholic Community Services, um, you know, we will work, we serve kind of any and all youth and families um, and really get excited about kind of challenges that, that are presented. So those are the Pierce County WISE providers. Um, and again, there's that number to be able to um, do that WISE screen and get um, see if a youth or family is eligible for WISE. Right. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Yeah. And are you able to speak to crisis services? Uh, I am not prepared. Okay. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. All right. So um, next we have, and one of the really important things that we know we need in our county is behavioral health navigation, right? How do we get access to these resources? And we are very fortunate here in Pierce County to have a great organization called South Sound 211. And so um, we are going to introduce next our partners at South Sound 211 and have Tracy, Tracy Bomar. And just to give you a little bit of information about Tracy, she is currently the behavioral health specialist for the South Sound. She is peer counselor certified and has worked with DCYF transporting and supervising children court ordered visits. She's also a mother and grandmother and believes that knowing where to find resources is the first step to wholeness. So I'm going to transition to Tracy to let us know a little bit more about South Sound 211 and their behavioral health navigation services. Thank you, Ashley. And thanks for inviting me. Um, so I am the behavioral health navigator at South Sound 211. And um, what we try to do is to connect 
persons who are calling for mental health or behavioral health resources to the best fit for them. Um, Ashley, is it possible to have the slides put up? Yes. All right, let me share my screen. All right, there we go. Okay. So um, Penny Belcher is the 211 director and um, Sarah Teague is the data manager. She's not able to be here today. So I will try to explain my part as best I can. And then um, we'll allow you to ask any questions I may be able to answer for you, okay? Um, the next slide, please. So 211, um, what a call at 211 is, is traditional, traditionally um, a place where people can call for basic needs and food pantries and housing resources and things like that from any nonprofit agency, um, from the phone number to their um, web link, whatever it may be to connect with them. Um, we have creative conversations with the persons who call South Sound 211. We try to find out what their needs are. And as we communicate with them and ask eligibility questions, it helps us unpack what may be there underneath that they may not even realize they're interested in finding resources for. And so it helps us be able to see all the different layers that they have in their situation. And it could be anything from transportation to basic food benefits, to behavioral health, to parenting health. It could be a number of different things. Sometimes they even call for legal resources, for general legal resources they need help with. So those are all options. Um, screening um, and intake can um, take time and it, it's sometimes for coordinated entry services, we do screen for that. We also help with transportation intakes for people who maybe are starting a new job but they don't have transportation. And we can oftentimes serve that um, need for the first three weeks or the first paycheck. And all we have to do is call in and, and um, as long as they're in that space or area that is being served by that transportation service, then they can um, utilize that service. Um, but we do intakes for those things. We also do intakes for the basic food benefits such as food um, SNAP, EBT. Um, next slide, please. Um, other things that we do, um, the enhanced services that we have are the transportation navigators, as I said, for like the transportation to work, um, behavioral health navigation, housing solution navigators, family support. That's for people who have children who are five years old or younger. It could be anything from diaper resources to kind of helping them navigate through parenting, finding parenting resources, finding um, infancy um, needs that need to be met um, from different agencies. It can be um, services from our workforce development navigators, and they help connect people with community services that um, will help them maybe start a new career through some training or find some resources for where to find um, career opportunities when they're looking for new employment, things like that. Next slide, please. Um, for me, as a behavioral health navigator, um, the things that I do more in detail are assisting the callers to connect to the right behavioral health resources that they need. Um, and it can be just listening to their story, finding out what is really going on. Sometimes it, it is a need for the SUD um, resources. Sometimes it's just a warm line where they want to talk to somebody and have a safe place to talk because they have a family and they don't really feel safe sharing with people in the household. Sometimes it's um, just looking for those services where they can have a therapist to work through some things um, or any other type of service that's related to behavioral health for youth as well. Um, we do um, perform follow-ups about two weeks after they request that service. We try to give them a little time to try to locate and connect the right resource for their behavioral health needs because sometimes it does take more than just one try as we all know to find that perfect fit for them. So we do try to follow up and see how the agent that they talked with at 211 served them, if the resources were effective, if they learned any more about options or further resources that might be helpful to them, 
um, and how they felt their experience was not only with us, but with the behavioral health provider that they reached out to, because we want to make sure we're giving accurate information and that they're being effectively assisted with what their needs are. Um, we assist the callers in um, seeking those services and welcome them to call back if they find that they need other services so that we are not making them feel like, okay, it's a one and done time opportunity so that they can know that they can reach out to us again if they need it. Next slide, please. Um, now, there are two different ways that people can connect with us. We have email, which is on the screen, the 211 at uwpc.org. Um, and that's a way that some people prefer to connect with us. They don't really want to have that phone call conversation. They may be a little shy or uncomfortable, so they can reach out to us that way. And what we would do is we would send out a questionnaire to kind of find eligibility places like their zip code to know what places to navigate to, um, excuse me, to find out their income ability and their medical coverage to know what resources would be a best fit for them. So we have multiple ways of um, asking those el eligibility questions so that we can best suit their um, resource requests to their need. Um, the other thing is you can also call our general 211 line from the 253 area code, or you can call the 253-572-4357 number. And I'll say that again, 253-572-4357 number. And that will directly connect you to our call center where we have agents serving in all capacities. Any of us can assist you no matter which navigator or information specialist we are. Um, and so other things that we do is we try to listen to people and what their concerns are. We give um, a personal preference by being compassionate and giving them that option to call if they are willing and wanting to talk to a person and they really don't wanna deal with the technology or they're not able to deal with the technology, they may not have access to it. So um, we try to give them the most comfortable option for them to reach out to us at South Zone 211. Um, and then next slide, I think that may be the last one. But So are there any questions for me? I believe Ashley's asked that they be placed in the chat box, the question and answer chat box. If so, thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much. And Tracy, this might be a great question for you and any of our panelists can feel free to answer it. But one of the questions that came up is, um, are there resources um, or does anyone provide services for youth that come from parents or adults that have substance use disorders? There are, I believe there are. I would have to be able to physically go into the database because it would be conditioned on multiple things. It would be conditioned on what the zip code or area is, the age, the medical coverage, and then the detail of services and um, that they would you know, that they would be able to offer. So we would definitely look into that. And if it's not something that we could do, then I would, I usually, when I find a resource that may not be available for whatever the reason, I oftentimes will go to the next best resource and um, ask them if they would be willing to reach out to that agency, because sometimes agencies know of things that aren't registered with us. So we do try to kind of navigate that way as well. Good question. Thank you. Did any of our other panelists want to add to that question at all? All right. Well, I'm going to invite all of our panelists to, to come back to the screen. Um, I know when we had some registration, there were some really great questions that came up as people were registering. Um, I also do want to share that we are going to have a future webinar that will just be aimed at providing an overview of crisis services. Um, I know today was kind of a, a provider open house, so we had a very short amount, but I think we could talk about crisis services for a really long time. And so we want to be able to dedicate that time. And so we'll have a separate resource to talk about just our youth mobile crisis services here in Pierce County. 
But what I would recommend to you is that if you are a community-based organization, if you are a school district and you want Catholic Community Services to come out and talk to you about their services, they have been really receptive to that. I know I've partnered with them. We went to Sumner Bonnie Lake. We went and talked with Tacoma Police Department. And so there are those always the opportunities for those collaborations and partnership. You just have to reach out and ask. And I know that they've been doing a really great job of being able to provide that education. So I do want to let you guys know we will have a future webinar that will just talk about our youth mobile crisis services here in Pierce County. So with that, I'm going to um, lay a question out here for some of our panelists for today. Um, I know that we have a lot of participants here from school districts. And so what would you guys say are some strategies for best practices for collaborations and supports that school counselors can give students as they transition back and help families get connected to resources? Um, this is um, so I think one thing I think we hear pretty consistently as a barrier to accessing services and help is just the stigma around asking for help. And so, you know, I think we've heard today that, you know, peer support is an aspect that is embedded in a lot of the resources that are out there. And so I think it could be helpful for a youth or a family that's really expressing reluctance to to ask for the help um, based on kind of stigma or preconceived notions about what that means, whether it's offering to reach out together with that person um, could be helpful or encouraging them um, because what they're gonna be able to experience on the other end is not only you know, quality clinical work, but also oftentimes peer support as well. And so to even introduce the idea that, hey, Oftentimes a part of mental health services now includes, um, you know, being able to talk to somebody who might have some similar experiences. Um, and that can be a really helpful angle to explore someone's mental health challenges. And so I think as much as we can address stigma that people are feeling, um, that can be helpful in terms of reducing barriers to accessing services and help. Uh, following, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Following that same line of stigma, one thing that we look a lot is about language and uh, the type of words that we use when uh, engaging the youth in mental health support, mental health services. Uh, because one of the reasons we do work uh, with the Latinx community and there is a huge stigma about mental health and being like, I am local, I'm crazy and all that. And, and that stops uh, many of our community members to access help. Um, that use of um, a different language, a kinder language that mostly opens up for, let's have a talk, let's have a communication, maybe talking with someone that can listen to what you're feeling, um, might open more doors into accessing the community of youth um, into mental health services. I thought I would talk about a different angle, which is more about the logistics of getting kids into service and really trying to do that in a way that minimizes the amount of time that they're out of school, because I think we all want them in school. Um, we've been encouraging our families to, or the students to talk to schools about whether there is a way for them to do therapy during the day, ask for like a private place where they could maybe do a virtual session. So maybe they only miss a half an hour or 45 minutes rather than leaving in the middle of the day to come down to the agency and then miss maybe half the day. Um, everyone wants to be in after school um, services, but we are really stretched to provide um, after school services for everyone. I mean, it just can't be done. And we really want that not to be a barrier. We want everyone to be able to get into the mental health services that they need. So if you have space and you can talk to kids about um, whether they're able to do virtual or in person, if we happen to be in the building on that particular day, then that can also be a good thing.
Thank you for those great responses. Um, I saw a few questions that were looking for resources regarding grief and loss. And we know that our kids have experienced this um, on, on different levels, not just only an actual death, but just many of the, the losses that they've endured uh, throughout this pandemic. And so do you have any recommendations for resources um, for um, related grief and loss for our youth um, as they return back to school? Um, well, this is Sally at Greater Lakes. I mean, we have many therapists who have been affiliated with the Bridges program at Mary Bridge um, or have experience in grief in the past. So we can certainly serve them, but we usually refer to the Bridges program because they have some awesome groups. Um, and then, you know, they come back to us and tell us what a great time they had. And then we kind of take it from there. Yeah. Uh, B, uh, Bridges is a great program at Mary Bridge Children's Hospital that does provide grief and loss support um, for children who have experienced um, death. They also provide consultation and education for providers. So if you are a school counselor, you can reach out to them, ask for some education. Um, if you are in the Tacoma School District, um, we have access to an education consultant that we've been able to uh, develop some training for Tacoma Public School staff. So if that's something that you need that is specific to your community, I also encourage you to reach out to Kids Mental Health Pierce County. One of the great things about these webinars is we want them to be responsive to the community. So it's, it's easy for me to reach out to Brittany and say, hey, we have this topic. Could you do a webinar? Do you have some clinicians that could offer some strategies? Tiffany, do you have somebody from Catholic Community Services that we can maybe reach out to this school and do some education with these counselors and teachers? And that's just been the responsive network of this kind of collaboration. So if you are having those um, district-wide concerns, I mean, reach out and that's something that we can help support and provide some education and specific resources for. Um, let's see, there was lots of questions. Um, and I think you guys covered a lot of these. Would you say that there are, and I mean, we could just show hands, I, there, people were asking about specific resources for cognitive behavioral therapy. I believe most of your guys' organizations do provide that. Um, so, you know, if there is a specific modality that you are asking for, you know, I think it's important again, you know, one of the things that we try to do is really encourage that collateral information, right? Like if you are referring somebody to that agency, it's really helpful to have as much information as possible so that we can do a thorough assessment and make sure that that youth is getting the modality of treatment, the level of intensity that they need. And so um, having those ROIs be able to share that information really helps um, establish the, the right treatment plan for them. So I highly encourage that communication. Again, if you are somebody who's supporting that youth or making that referral, giving as much information as they can to be able to say, okay, this provider can do CBT or they need DBT. And that really allows them to, to make those recommendations. All right. So I think that those were our questions. I don't see any new questions in our Q&A box. Um, again, I wanna just thank all of our panelists for being here today and being willing to present this information. Um, I know we had a limited amount of time and I think we could talk about our services all day and what we wanna do. Um, I think it's easy for us oftentimes to focus on what we don't have in our community, but I think it's really, really important to highlight what we do have and the great work and commitment of our community partners in our community who have worked throughout the pandemic, have been flexible and really have partnered to really try to strengthen our youth behavioral health system here in Pierce County. So thank you for taking the time to be here and listen to this information. I think it will be so helpful in helping guide people to the right resources. Um, and we hope to continue to have these throughout the year and bring more organizations to the forefront. Um, but again, we will give this information out. This will be recorded to the website. We'll also send out the slides um, to your email as well. Um, again, I wouldn't be a program manager if I didn't say visit our website, kidsmentalhealthpiercecounty.org. 
Every organization here today has a link on that website where you can visit their websites and get additional information as well. So with that, I'm happy to give you guys all four minutes back in your day. I can't believe we squeezed all this into an hour and a half, but we did it. Um, so thank you again to our panelists and thank you all for attending and be on the lookout for future webinars and they will all be on our website, kidsmentalhealthchriscounty.org. So thank you and have a great rest of your day.